Question number 17. Which of the following is the best criteria for determining readiness for excavation? A. Three second head lift. B. No fade by double burst simulation seen in the corrugator supercilii. C. Tidal volume of 500 cc's. Or D. No fade by train of force stimulation seen in the orbicularis oculi. And the answer is B. No fade by double burst stimulation seen in the corrugator supercilii. Looking at the various muscles that we can use to assess neuromuscular blockade, probably the most commonly used is the corrugator supercilii. Innervated by cranial nerve number seven or the facial nerve, it is located lateral to the bridge of the nose, and its use causes us to frown. The orbicularis oculi, also innervated by cranial nerve number seven, is the circumferential muscle surrounding the eye, and its use causes us to blink or squint. Now, the levator palpebrae superoris, innervated by cranial nerve number three, or the oculomotor nerve, is not really assessed by neuromuscular stimulation, but it is commonly discussed in the context of eye movements, and its use causes our eye lids to open. The flexi carpi ulnaris is, as you know, innervated by the ulnar nerve, and it causes our wrists to flex and adduct. The adductor pollicis, also innervated by ulnar nerve, causes our thumbs to adduct. If you're ever concerned about whether your stimulator were causing the muscle to be stimulated directly, or the nerve to be stimulated, you can follow the motion of the adductor pollicis and adduction of the thumb. If the thumb is moving, then you are stimulating the nerve directly. Looking at the time course of onset and offset of action of various muscle groups, you can see that the corrugator supercilii follows the larynx and the diaphragm most closely with its onset and offset. The orbicularis oculi and adductor pollicis have a bit of a delay. So it's your goal to extubate in the most timely fashion at the safest and earliest time you can following the corrugator supercilii uh, best correlates with laryngeal muscle function. Looking at the different patterns of stimulation you could obtain using a neuromuscular stimulator, if you had a profound degree of blockade such that even a single twitch wouldn't produce any response uh, and only sustained tetanus would give you a post-tetanic twitch of one. A post-tetanic count of one suggests you will have a long time before you have a turn of a single twitch, as long as 10 minutes before your train of ratio, train of four ratio equals one. That means if you have only a post-tetanic twitch, it's gonna be at least 10 minutes before you even think about reversing a patient. Looking at the train of four count, just the number of times you get twitches in response to a train of four stimulation. If you had a train of four count of one, it means you have a profound level of blockade. As much as 90 to 95% of your receptors will be blocked. On the other hand, if you have a train of four count of four, it means you still have a significant degree of blockade. 60 to 85% of your receptors will be blocked. If you had the ability to accurately detect the intensity or strength or height of a T1 to T4, or T4 to T1 response, that ratio, called the train of four ratio, if it were 0.4, would mean that you'd be clinically weak, your tidal volume might be okay, but your force vital capacity would not. And this is the visual threshold for detecting fade. Your eyes cannot reliably detect greater degrees of return of function. So when you see no fade, uh, it could be 0.4 or higher, but it could be as little as 0.4. A 24 ratio of 0.5 correlates with a three second head lift, but still a low FVC. A 0.75 24 ratio correlates with a five second head lift, but still possibly a low FVC. A 24 ratio of 0.8 correlates with the ability to cough, a normal FVC, but still the possibility of diplopia. And it's said that it's not until you have a 24 ratio of above 0.9, that your pharyngeal and upper esophageal and airway protective muscles are adequate. It should be apparent to you that if a trained of a ratio 
of greater than 0.9 is required to guarantee return of protective airway reflexes that what we can see with our eyes reliably, the training for ratio of 0.4, is grossly inadequate for determining return of function before extubation. That's why people prefer the double burst stimulation. Now, double burst stimulation is not really two bursts alone. It's three bursts at a frequency of 50 hertz, separated by um, 750 milliseconds, followed by another burst of three bursts, three twitches, at a frequency of 50 hertz. And if you see no fade by double burst stimulation, then you can be sure that your train for ratio is at least 0.6 to 0.7. Now, looking at the chart, 0.6 to 0.7 doesn't guarantee normal forced vital capacity. 0.6 to 0.7 doesn't guarantee complete return of protective airway reflexes, but it's better than 0.4, and double burst stimulation is preferred, therefore, to visual train for ratio monitoring. I should say, even better than both of those, train for ratio and double burst stimulation is sustained tightness at 50 hertz. When you stimulate a nerve at a frequency of 50 hertz, you are maximally depleting the presynaptic neuron of acetylcholine. And if you have no fade at that high rate of stimulation, you are, in terms of neuromuscular function, back. Having said that, experts say you cannot completely exclude the possibility of residual neuromuscular blockade, even with sustained tetanus, for a variety of reasons, one of which is you could be actually overstimulating the nerve, leading to a false positive, if you will. So looking at this chart, there is no perfect monitor, at least one that's widely available. Since you don't have mechanomography, we're stuck with doing the best we can, using double burst when we can, and using our clinical judgment about when it's safe to extubate a patient. Miller summarized these concepts nicely in his chapter, which I summarize as a series of commandments. Number one, thou shalt not use long-acting neuromuscular blockades. I mean, why use a long agent when often a short one suffices? Number two, thou shalt monitor train of four, although it be inaccurate, and that's just a compromise. If we had double burst stimulation, I think that would be even better. Um, if we had uh, the ability to do sustained, te sustained tetanus, which has been my practice for 20 years, that can be an adjunct to safe monitoring. My only caveat about using sustained tetanus is, I think it's important that the person looking at the sustained tetanus at the end of the case is the same one that saw it at the beginning, because it's only knowing baseline that you can detect change or re complete return of function. Number three, thou shalt avoid complete ablation of twitch. Uh, that's a lesson that we've all learned uh, from a surgeon who's canceled the case rather suddenly, and if you cancel a case with an extreme degree of blockade, like no twitches, we can't safely reverse. So many cases can be done safely with one twitch in the background. That's my typical goal, especially when the case could be one in which extubation um, occurred sooner than expected. Number four, thou shalt try thy best to reverse the train of four above point two, uh, point train for ratio of three. Uh, four, the more twitches you have back in reverse, the greater the likelihood that residual blockade will not be a problem. Certainly, I've done it at one. I've even done it at a post-Titanic count of one. It's just taken a long time before I was able to execute the patient safely. So two is a safe recommendation. Five, thou shalt know that double burst stimulation is more sensitive to train of four. As I said before, I like the same tetanus, but you know we don't always have DBS. That is the problem. Number six, thou shalt know clinical signs, head lift, and no fadeth. Uh, train of four, double burst, even tetanus, does not completely exclude the possibility of residual blockade. So that's the problem, right? Using our eyes, there's no clinical guarantee that we can be 100% back. So I would say, as long as the patient had no fade by double burst stimulation, no fade by sustained tetanus at 50 hertz for five seconds, possibly the ability to lift the head for five seconds, that the chances of residual blockade are markedly diminished. And finally, number seven, you should have at least one neuromuscular stimulator in every OR and recovery room, just to have the ability to check function in case um, there's a question of adequate return. Just to review, choice A, three second head lift can be achieved 
with a train for a ratio of 0.5, which is obviously inadequate to guarantee return of airway protective reflexes. Choice B, no fade by double burst simulation seen in the corrugator supercilii is probably the best site and probably the best monitor among the choices provided. Choice C, tidal volume of 500 cc's can be achieved with a train for ratio of 0.4, again, inadequate for airway protection. And choice D, no fade by train of force simulation seen in the orbicularis oculi is probably not the best site nor the best monitor given the choices available.